refreshing for me. And I want to thank all of you for being participants in that ministry of comfort and consolation. We're talking about spiritual peace. <clears throat> this time I want to make an attempt to define spiritual peace and how it is obtained. There's an expression made by the psalmist that is germane to this subject, found in Psalm 4, 8. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, for thou Lord, only, makest me dwell in safety. <clears throat> See, uh, when you sleep, you're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Take Christ out of the scenario. Take God out of the scenario. Mm -hmm. You're vulnerable. You don't have control of your mind. It could be a very dangerous time. Some people have taken their own lives because of what occurred when they were sleeping. I've had terrible thoughts in my sleep. And when I awakened, I was so thankful God made me dwell in safety. Amen. Yeah, it has to do with the peace we're talking about. Peace, from an experiential point of view, peace is what we call cognitive, that is, you define it, look at it, understand it. But in another sense, it's not. It's, it defies explanation. You can't really explain it. Someone else that doesn't have peace, you'll find it very difficult to explain to them that you do. Hard to understand. And there's no easy way to, or convenient way to obtain spiritual peace. I suppose it'd be nice if we could tell you to come forward. We lay our hands on you and pray for you and you get peace. Or maybe someone could just like pronounce a blessing over you. I don't deny that this is possible, understand. I'm just telling you I can't do it. And peace can't be manufactured by man's program. You can't say, now here I figured out a way, if you follow these steps, you'll end up having peace. It won't come that way. Spiritual peace is actually, at the bottom line, is a result of believing God. That's what it boils down, what it boils down. Believing God. Living and that involves living close to Him and being submitted to them. Peace has nothing to do with outward circumstances. It's transcendent or above earthly circumstances. There could be turmoil going on all around you and you can have peace. Peace, peace is to the soul what the calming of the Sea of Galilee was to the disciples. Here they are rowing across the sea at the Lord's command. I say at the Lord's command. Mm -hmm. Jesus told them to go to the other side and they got, a, got in a storm doing... Well, you probably don't know what I'm talking about here. But. <laughs> <laughs> you can run into a lot of agitation just doing what Jesus told you to do. This is true. That happened to them. They encountered this storm. Uh, they, scripture says they continued rowing. They didn't say, well, it was too tough. Let's turn around and go back. We'll try it again tomorrow morning. <laughs> they, exact words are they toiled in rowing toward the other side, where Jesus told them to go. But this storm was holding them back. All of a sudden, they spied 
somebody walking on top of this stormy waters. They thought it was a spirit, or we'd say a ghost. And Jesus made as though he's going to walk right past them. <laughs> they hailed him down, oh, <laughs> over here. <laughs> he came over there, see? you got to learn to do this. You have to be spiritually vocal. Sometimes it looks like Jesus is going to pass you by. The other person is getting the blessing, seems to be all right on the other side over there. But you got to cry out, over here, hey! Jesus came over there. Of course, his word is powerful, you understand? And he spoke to the storm. Peace be still. Yeah. Calm. Now, when you have trouble, you can you can choose to fight with it and wrestle with it. I don't advise it. But you can do this. Here's where living close to God is very, very critical. By critical, I mean it's very essential. Because it sensitizes, when you live close to Christ, it sensitizes your spirit so you can kind of tell when he's in the vicinity, so to speak. If you don't, you'll never know there was someone walking on the storm you were in. Just don't, it just won't see it. But if you live close to the Lord, what does that mean, live close to the Lord? It means you never get out of range of his voice. You can get out of range of Jesus' voice. Where he may be talking to your heart, but you're just too far away. Or maybe you're like those folk when Jesus prayed to God. He said, glorify thy name. God Almighty spoke out of heaven and said, said I have both glorified it and I glorify it again. Some people said, what's thunder? Just got through thunder. Did you hear that thunder? Yeah. Some people, they're a little more advanced. He said, he was an angel. That, that's what that was. That's an angel. They had a little further advanced. <laughs> first people from the first church in Frigidaire. I don't know if they have an established <laughs> congregation here, but we got a couple of first church of the Frigidaire. In job <laughs> the people that they got a little bit of interest they said they get the end of the angel category but Jesus he knew he knew who spoke he said this voice didn't come for my years that came for mine this is I know who this was now you can be that type of person if you're a follower of Christ you can have that same kind of receptivity to God. And during the time when the people are rejecting you like they were Jesus, if you listen and you're sensitive enough, God will ensure you, I'm with you. I'll not forsake you. As he said to Jacob, I'll not forsake you till I have done all that I told you. I'm going to do it. But you have to be close to hear. So obtaining peace. You can't make the trouble stop. Or maybe you've tried. Maybe you learned this by experience. You can't make it stop. You've got the agitation at the job. You've got the agitation in the neighborhood. Maybe you get the agitation in the house. And you, you, can't, you can't make it stop. You may even try to make it stop. Well, we'll just, pay, we'll just have more commandments in the house. That, that'll do it. And you find out how utterly stubborn kids can be. <laughs> Or, you can say, I know he's here. I know he's here somewhere. I know that Jesus is walking on this storm somewhere. Because the scripture said, the eye of the Lord is on the righteous. See? He, he knows the eye of the Lord is upon the righteous. He's watching them every step. Even when the sea is stormy, even when life's difficult, even when you're just about ready to give up, where Paul would say, despair of life. That's where you're at, you know. But summon up your faith. 
So how do I do that? Well, I can't, I can't tell you how to do that. <laughs> I think probably the best way is to be determined to do it. Look down the deep depths of your soul and see. Let's see, what do I, what do I think about God? Talk it over with yourself. What, 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 what's God able to do? Talk it over with yourself. Talk to yourself. When David, one time, he was opposed by his soldiers, they were just about to kill him. He says, the scripture says, and David strengthened himself in the Lord. He strengthened himself. They have peace. That's, it really comes a time you have to do that. You have to build up yourselves in your most holy faith, prayed in the Holy Spirit. See? That's what Jude said to do. And you do this, and all of a sudden it dawns on your spirit. The Lord is here. The Lord is with me. He said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's what he said. Lord, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. See? You know this in your soul. Now, now, now you know this. You settle it in your heart. Now you kind of, you, you look for him, so to speak. Try and find a sign of his presence. And sometimes it will be, I know this person over there could be causing me a lot more trouble than he is. The Lord's present. <laughs> See, the Lord can put a damper on the opposition. So they still oppose you, but it's not like it could be mm -hmm. at all. So you call out for the Lord and you... You depend on the Lord quieting the storm. You cease from your own labors. And you enter into his labors. Because Jesus, you see, has been here in the world, in the earth. He's been here. What spiritual peace? Peace is knowing. Now, knowing in Scripture means convinced of, but you have to add that because of the people today. Knowing and being convinced of this, that all things work together for good. Not to everybody now, not to everybody. No. All things work together for good to them that love God, that it, 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 not, not, it's not all, and, and are called according to his purpose. Yeah. We know that's true. That verse, uh, Romans 8.28 follows, as you already know, Amos 8, Romans 8.26, which says the Holy Spirit <laughs> makes intercession for us when we know not what to pray for as we should. We just don't know what to pray for as we should. But here's how much God has invested in your salvation. Here's how thorough he has been. He has supplied an intercessor in heaven, and he supplied an intercessor in you. The Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So the Holy Spirit surveys your inventory, your spiritual inventory. He knows, well, brother, sister, so and so need this. But they don't know they need it. <laughs> Father, I'm coming to you now on behalf of this son or daughter of yours down here. And the scripture says that God knows the mind of the spirit. They, and they can converse. This, and here's what they need. I'm asking you to send it to them on behalf of Christ. So you get something you never asked for. That's marvelous now. I'll tell you, if your salvation depended at any point on just what you know, Oh. Well, you'd be in bad stability. You may know it today, you may forget it tomorrow, see? Mm -hmm. But the Holy Spirit, see how faithful he is? We know not what to pray for as we ought. So there's things you really do need. God knows you need it. Jesus knows you need it. The Spirit knows you need it. You don't know you need it. So the Spirit makes intercession. I don't doubt that one of these things that can happen is peace. I don't doubt. That sometimes you will get in a situation where you sorely need peace, but somehow this hasn't registered with you. You don't see it. You don't see it plain enough. Maybe you think what you need is more money or more time or more friends or whatever. 
But it's peace. Peace is the thing you need. But you don't know it, but the Spirit does. He makes intercession. Amen. And then the next verse says, all things work together for good. See, that's the next verse. Which means some of these things working together for good depend on your loving God, depend on you being called of God, and depend often on the intercession of the Holy Spirit. But if you uh, have been reared in a spiritual or I don't know, a spiritual environment, it's not the word, a church environment, you've been raised in a church environment where you, you, they don't talk about these things. They just they got important things like parking lots. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm telling you the truth now. There's some churches that the biggest item on the agenda is the parking lot. Just the Jewish parents said it went, how long, it went for a while. That was the number one concern was the parking lot. It wasn't filled either, I might add. So you see this, knowing, if you want peace, spiritual peace involves knowing, comprehending, understanding, discerning, having a grasp of the fact that this thing is part of what God is working together. <laughs> he takes all the hodgepodge of your life, he takes it together, and he makes it fit. Now, in uh, mechanics, they call it synergy, they call this it now, they call this in uh, business life, in synergy. <coughs> synergy is where one part makes another part. Work. A car engine is a picture of synergy. The parts all work together to produce one thing. This is how all things working together. He takes all of life, the sorrows and the, and the gladness, and the difficulties, and the things that were pretty easy, and the friends, and the foes the pains and the pleasures. He works them all together so they make up something that will transport to eternity. Amen. See the important thing, there's only, there's only two places here and there. That, there's only two times now and then. That's it. So now the aim is to get from here to there and now to then. That's why all things got to work together. See, it, your life can't be chaos and you make it there. That's something of what peace is. Peace is knowing Paul, he's enduring a lot of opposition, a lot of personal sorrow. He had a lot of concern for the churches. Oh, with the God, we had a lot of people like that. Their, their concern was for the churches. Because if the church isn't working, nothing the church is supposed to do will be working very well at any rate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he looked at his life, and if he'd had a counselor, he'd said, oh, Brother Paul, you really got your problems. I can see that. I think what you need, a sabbatical. That's, that's, that's what you need, a sabbatical. That'll help you to kind of gather your strength. Paul says, no, I know. It's again we're talking about cognition, perception. He sees this. This isn't just pretty words. I know this will turn out to my salvation. I know this is going to, it looks like it's against, but I know this is going to contribute to my salvation. That's peace. Mm -hmm. Peace, uh, peace of God is being resolute. And I want to uh, give you an example of resoluteness in the uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now these three men, they were boys, young boys. Daniel and these men were young boys when they were taken captivity. And estimate 13, 15, somewhere in there. But they'd been told, they'd been raised right. 
They took the side of God and they fetched and these three men became pretty governors and became key men in Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar, he, he built this tremendous statue, stuck it out there in a the plane, commanded everybody to bow down, worship that image, or face the consequences of being burned in a fiery furnace, or in our language, or face the consequences of losing your job. <laughs> or face the consequences of losing your house, or whatever. Now here's what these men uh, said. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer thee about this matter. They meant, you notice, Nebuchadnezzar, that we haven't called for a prayer meeting. Did you notice that, uh, Neb? We don't have to pray about this. this. This is not even a crisis for us. We know that our God's able to deliver us. There's no question there. We know that can happen. And he will deliver us, O king. But means that in some way it will work out. But if not, we want you to know this. We're not going to serve your gods, nor worship the golden image you've set up. That's resolute. Mm -hmm. Now at some point, if you want peace with God and peace in your heart, you have to be resolute. Mm -hmm. Some of you, particularly some young people, some older too, some of their peers or people in their group are trying to get them to shape up according to the things that they know are not right. Yeah. And they threaten them by, we won't be your friend anymore, and so forth. But being resolute says, look, God could like take care of this whole situation right away. He could, he could like carry us away from it. He could take you, drop dead. I mean, there's a lot of things that could be done. But whatever, whatever, whatever God does, we're not going to compromise our faith. We're not going to bow down to your ideas. What? That's what peace enables you to do. When your heart's, when your heart has peace, you can be resolute because you know where you stand. You know where God stands. You know God's for you, not against you. See, you know, you know that. It's, this isn't like a theological point. This is what we believe in our church. We believe that's not it. It's that you're convinced of this. So your peace carries you through this troubled circumstance. You might know there comes a time of peace will teach you this. That God, this is 1 Peter 5, 10, that God will after you suffer a while. <laughs> I said, after you suffer for I, You know what I'm talking about. After you suffer for a while, for, for a while, for a while. Now for Moses' case, for a while it was 40 years. For Noah's, it was 120 years. So for a while, if you're not busy for the Lord, oh, it seems like a long time. It seems like a long time. When you're working for the Lord, it makes your sufferings brief, more momentary. Even in, uh, even in the flesh, remember when God told Adam, you're going to eat your meat with sweat of your brow. The ground's not going to yield to you. You're going to have to weed it out and everything. You're going to have to work, work, work. But it's, I choose to call it therapeutic work. In this kind of work, you keep out of some trouble. You do. Part of peace, having peace, is, so to speak, keeping busy, doing legitimate things, you may not like it that you have to be so busy, but it, it, it'll keep you occupied. It will. It'll keep you occupied. 
And the peace of God can like grow because the peace of God works best in troublesome times. That's when it does its work. Amen. That's when it's valuable. Mm -hmm. That's when you want it. Mm -hmm. Peace. After you've suffered a while, establish, stable, make you make you firm so you can stand a tornado. Mm -hmm. Strengthen a strong tree, can't blow it over easy. And settle you. Can't be moved, can't be easily be moved. That's after you've settled for all, God will do this. Now when you know this, you will get peace. Until you know this, you will not have peace. You will be easily troubled, easily agitated, easily moved until you've learned that truth. <coughs> that God is not trying to make things nice for you. That's not what this is all about. This is not about you having an easy life. That's not what it's about. See, Ephesians 3.10 tells us one of the things God is doing. He is showing principalities and powers his wisdom through the church. So really, now I understand some people can't receive this, but I'm going to say it anyway. People aren't really the ultimate point. God is showing principalities and powers in heavenly places, his manifold, that multifarious wisdom by working through the church. For instance, <clears throat> scriptures make it clear that God wants to make known his love, his kindness, his mercy, his grace. He wants to make this known. He wants, he wants these traits to be seen. And evidently they had not been seen prior to Christ. We do have a record of a rebellion that spoke out in heaven and it was not meant with kindness or love or mercy or grace. Satan is supposed to pitch out. And here's God. He wants to make this known. So now, how do you make your mercy known? How how can it be made? Well, you have to have somebody that needs mercy. <laughs> it's not philosophical. God's mercy is not philosophical. It's something that's real, but it, it postulates that there's somebody that needs mercy. Somebody that needs to be kind to them. Needs God to be kind to them. So what he does, he, the church is the arena in which he's making this, making this known. He wants you to have some significant insight into his love, his mercy, his kindness, his wisdom. He wants you to see this because when you do, peace comes with the understanding. Peace comes with the understanding. So you say, Lord, I don't want the angels to be disappointed, but what's going on here? <laughs> One place in 1 Corinthians 11, he was dealing with some of the divisions there. There have been some outbreaks from some of the women. The text indicates they were asking questions like in the middle of a prophet speaking. And he told them, about, he said, now you got to remember this uh, this order is that the head of the woman is the man, the head of the man is Christ, and the head of Christ is God. Now see, for those that denigrate women, I've never heard them, never, not one time, heard them talk about the man being subject to Christ. And I come from background, we heard an awful lot about what the women could, shouldn't do, and what they can't do. I never heard anything about what men. It's like men had a right to whatever, do whatever they wanted to do. But in that dissertation, the 11th chapter, he says women ought to have power on their heads, which means they should speak like a subordinate to their husband. Man should speak like a subordinate to Christ, and Christ speaks as a subordinate to God. So being a subordination is not degrading. And he says, women ought to have power in their head. And he answers, because of the angels. Hmm. 
They're here today. I can tell you that if you can look up in the front pew up here, and you actually saw this Michael and Gabriel sitting there, it would change how you acted. Wow. Mm -hmm. I can tell you if you tend to be dozy, you wake up real quick. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? See, this ties in with this what I told you, that he's demonstrated to angels. Angels are watching what's going on. They have an interest in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you know that, it does, it ministers peace to you. Being, having peace is, you're more aware of God than you are of the circumstance. <coughs> the circumstance is significant, yes. We don't deny that. We don't deny that there are things in life that are difficult indeed to bear. We don't deny that. That's the way it is. We, we've been through it. We know it. But God is greater than that circumstance. But if you don't believe it, the circumstance will drown you. Yeah. Knowing it gives you peace. Now how, uh, see that definition of peace, I, I gave it so you have to kind of think it out. Because there's no like grammatical definition of peace in the Bible. Not that way. How is peace obtained? As the word said in Job 22, 21, it says, Acquaint now thyself with the Almighty and be at peace. Acquaint, acquaint now thyself with the Almighty and be at peace. All right, now I ask you, how acquainted are you with God? What do you know about it? How comfortable do you feel in his presence? If you're married, you're acquainted with your wife, and you can hold an intelligent conversation about your husband, what he likes, where he goes, what he does. You're acquainted with him. I'm afraid, our beloved brethren, that there are a lot of Christians that aren't acquainted with God. They don't know the way he is. They don't know how he regards people that serve him. How he's not unrighteous to forget their work of faith and labor of love. Not God. Everybody else may, but not God. They don't know how intolerant he is with sin. They don't know how much he wants to give the person, but the person has to have an open hand to receive it. In Missouri, we have a restaurant, Lambert's. They call it the place of the throwing roll. Have you heard of this? No. And what is a man walks around with a bucket of rolls, fresh rolls, and he, he throws them to you. You may be on the other side of the room, he throws a roll to you. God never throws a blessing. You can't get out there and never, never land. Say, chuck it over here, you know. This isn't the way. He hands it. You gotta you, you gotta take it from his hand. Acquaint now thyself with the Almighty. If you're acquainted with the Almighty, you'll know all the wonderful things He has to give. And they are locked. What He has to give. You can only get them close up. Drawing nigh. Being near. Draw nigh with a true heart. Your conscience and he washed, cleansed. Your body's washed with pure water as the first year of baptism. Draw nearer to God in that. Believe me when I tell you, you'll get peace. Peace is obtained simultaneously with being justified in the, in the big picture. Being justified by faith, Romans 5, 1 says, being, now, 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 being justified by faith, we have I said we have peace. peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Being justified means the record of the sin is gone. In the books of heaven, there's no charge. It was all transferred over to Christ's ledger. Mm -hmm. well, amen. So now you see that being justified in your faith is what... Your faith is the hand. 
So your faith is like a hand to the soul. Your faith is what gets hold of what God has to has to offer. And as you get hold of it, and what God has to, excuse me, what God has to offer is complete exoneration. Books wiped clean. No record of sin. Conscience purged from dead work to serve the living God. Your sin may bother you, your past sin. It's not necessary that they do. But they may bother you, but they don't bother God. Amen. He said, I will remember their sins no more. And some of these sins are like bad. But when it dawns on you, so I'm justified by faith, I'm actually, God accepts me. Not as I am. I've heard this. God receives you just like you are. This, these men should find a job at Walmart. <laughs> the readers, you know, they got no business standing for people and telling them what God does. God doesn't receive you just like you are. He's got to change you. Amen. Before he receives you. <coughs> and by faith he does do that. He alters you. And when you know that, you've been justified. Whatever your past, you may be a persecutor of the church. You may be that that was a, like an ultimate sin. You think drunkenness is bad? You think drug addiction is bad? Well, it's not half as bad as persecuting the church, which is Christ's body. When you touch that, you're touching the apple of God's eye. You're like poking your finger in God's eye. Very sensitive stuff. But justification, Acts 13, 39 puts it this way. Through Christ, you are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law. The law did not have an eraser on it. Grace does. <laughs> Justification does. So when you know this is the result of being justified by faith. This is like the foundational piece that your practical piece draws from. Another uh, word for peace is a lack of agitation. Job 34, 29 says, He gives quietness. Oh, oh. What a blessed word. <laughs> he gives quietness. Settles. That's what peace is. That's what it is. It's like that stormy seas. Calm down. So how do you have that? You have to be near to God. You have to be close to Him. You have to be aware of Him. Conscious of Him. You have to see him where nobody else can see him. You have to do this. And he'll cause you to dwell safely. Psalm 48. You could dwell safe wherever you are. You could dwell, live, inhabit, stay safely. That's peace. When you know that, that's peace. So all these things, like Jacob one time, that Pharaoh said to told his brothers, said, you've got to bring, uh, bring your brother Simeon down here. They didn't, his brothers didn't know they were talking to Joseph. But when they told Jacob, he said, all these things are against me. Man, my life is not working out at all. First I lose Joseph, now you're going to take Simeon. All these things are against me. But when you're dwelling safely, you can look at the same circumstances like Jacob did later and see I was safe all the time. <coughs> Satan cannot do with you what he wants to do. God won't let him do what he wants to do. And when you know that, you have peace. Peace proceeds from meekness. Great peace. The peace of, of the meek. The meek have great peace. Great peace. Meek. The word meek means easily controlled. It's it picks, the picture is sort of a horse that has a lot of strength, but it can be controlled by the by the reins. 
Like by nature, you may be like bullheaded and stubborn, you know. I'm, I, by nature, that, I'm kind of that way myself. But God can direct a person like that. If you don't direct easy, he has a way of getting a bit in your mouth. You know? That's why he says, don't be like the horse and the mule, which have to be guided by a bit and a bridle. Don't be, don't, don't be the that sort of person God's got to knock you down to get your attention. But there are people like this. There, there are people like this. Years of my, it's been 50-some years ago. There was a man that was a very unrighteous man. He was married to one of the ladies at the church. And he was uh, at the hospital. He was really in bad shape. I went to see him. His name was Charles Eaton. He ran for, served the Lord finally and became a great man of God. And I said, well, Chuck, we call him Chuck. I said, I see the Lord knock you down where he could get your attention. And I said, you know, you've been like a pig. You know, a pig's eyes are slanted downwards. A pig can't look up. Oh, I can't check it out. Their eyes are slanted down toward the earth, their neck doesn't go up. There's people like a, they're like a pig, swine. Not easily directed. Their heads are just bilking at the earth all the time. These people will never have peace till they learn to look up. Mm -hmm. That's when you get the peace. And we don't want to forget too that peace is the fruit of the spirit. <laughs> Love, joy, peace, third number three, peace. Peace is being spiritually minded. To be spiritually minded, Romans 8, 6 says, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. peace. Are you spiritually minded? You, you got a what kind of probe. Are you spiritually minded? That is, is your thinking in concert with the Holy Spirit? Where you like here, you got your own little thing you're thinking about. You spiritually minded? If you are, you got peace. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. This evidence, peace, it's evidence of the reign of God. The kingdom of God is not in meat and drink. We dedicate this to all the diet people, you know, they need to know this. The kingdom of God is not, not, and meat and drink, but in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans 14, 17. So as part of peace is connected with God ruling and you knowing his ruling. It's the kingdom of God. The reign of God is in righteousness. People under his reign willingly do not act wickedly. It's peace. They're not agitated all the time. And it's a Holy Spirit works in them. Peace ultimately, it comes from God. Several epistles begin this way. Grace and peace unto you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Peter, and in John he says, Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you. See? From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So there you got a double hitter. From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. But it all depends on how important God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ are to you. Mm -hmm. Whether you really are living for God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Or whether you just say you are. It's not, no one else can settle this, but you're the one that has to diagnosis to come up, but if you are, if you are living for God, you presented your body a living sacrifice to God, you're living unto him that died for you and rose again, if this is true, peace is on the way to you from God in copious quantities and on a regular basis. Don't try and live tomorrow on the peace you had today. I thank God for days. I mean, what if a day was like three weeks long? Whew. Could have been, you know. God put this thing in segments deliberately. 
so you can live out a day at a time. If you made miscalculations, you can correct them. You see how, see how it works, and peace comes from God. And the result is the result of God being with you. Now, comment on how peace is obtained. It's the result of God being with you. Philippians 4 9 says, The peace of God be with you. The peace of God be not on you. The peace of God be with you. And this springs from believing. God of all grace, fill you <clears throat> with all joy and peace in believing. There it is, it's all spilled out. Give you all joy, all peace in believing. See? That's how you get it. That's how you get it. So let's say that. You know there's a lot of preaching that doesn't have anything to do with believing, trusting, depending, relying. So a lot of preaching doesn't have anything at all to do with you relying upon God, trusting in Him, leaning on Him. But when it, what you hear and how you think does have to do with that, your peace will come to you from God. I like this uh, expression in 2 Thessalonians 3.16. He said, The Lord give you all peace always by all means. <laughs> yes. How about that? That pretty well covers it. I can't forget this. Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have they that love thy law. It was, well, the law has passed away. Well, you're going to have a hard time with that, but see. The law has passed away as a means, as a means to righteousness. That's what Romans 10, 4 says. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You love God's law? Say, which law is it? Well, take your pick. If God laid down a law, do you think he's going to erase it? Do you really think he's going to erase it? Can God really change his mind? Can he alter his promise? Can he take back a word he said? No, he cannot. He changes the law as a means to righteousness. I still love his law. I love his commandments. I love what he's told us to do. I had to learn to do it. It wasn't like automatic, at least not for me. Maybe it was easy for you, but it wasn't. I had to learn to do it. But if you love his law, and you don't argue with him about it, you will have not only peace, you will have great peace. You will have... That's some things that... Uh, have to do with obtaining peace. But you see, of course, all of that uh, presumes that you want peace. This has been nothing more than a boring lecture, if that's not the case. And just to make sure you will want peace, the Lord lets Satan rough you up once in a while. <laughs> you know, G Jesus said, Simon, <clears throat> Satan has desired you to sift you like wheat. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, but I told him he can't do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Satan has desired you. What kind of, does Satan desire you? See, some people, Satan's already got them. He doesn't desire them. Mm -hmm. Satan desired to sift you as wheat, but he said, what, what, what? I prayed for you. That you wouldn't be sifted? No, no. I prayed for you that your faith not fail. Mm -hmm. And Peter's faith didn't fail. It went through the millstone, but the very same night, the very same hour, he denied Christ. Jesus looked at him. Peter saw it and repented. And he never again denied Jesus. Yeah. Never again. See? Never again. 
did he deny it? So you, uh, who knows whether Satan's asked for you or not? If you haven't been a, a diligent person in the kingdom of God, I would suspect maybe he hasn't worked for you. But if you're like a, a pivotal person that God's working through and there's things being accomplished by you, and, and you have in your presence, Brother Jeff and his wife, there are people like this. There are people God will defend. He'll stand up and defend them. There's some people God won't, he won't fight for them. He'll stand up and defeat, defend them, see, give them great peace. You can be this sort of a person. Salvation makes you this kind of a person. In Christ Jesus, everything, everything every resource required to make you acceptable in God's sight and usable by God had been supplied. It's, everything is there. Mm -hmm. Like today, if you haven't been this way, today you can, you can do it. You can start it now, instantly. You can be productive in God's kingdom. And Satan can be irritated because you're making inroads into his kingdom. Rescuing people from his, from his snares. So, I pray all of you will have a lot of real genuine peace. Be able to lay down in peace. Be able to go through trials with peace. Be able to face disappointments with peace. Mm -hmm. Be able to confront enemies with peace. Be able to endure all manner of hardships, oppositions, misunderstandings, you name it. But during these turbulent seas, you're quiet inside. There's a song called Blessed Quietness. <laughs> Blessed Quietness. This is the hymn that's new uh, <clears throat> about this. So spiritual peace. You see, it's a big, big subject. It's hard to... <clears throat> Hard to condense into a few words. I've, uh, I was about to say I've done my best, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure I did do my best. But I was thinking uh, some time ago that if I had the opportunity to ask for one thing, like Jesus said to Bartimaeus, "What do you want?" So if I, what would I want? What would I ask? Well, when he uh, gave me young married years, I had twin girls that had uh, epilepsy, and each of them had 45 seizures every day. They were five years old. It was, uh, it was hard. I prayed to God about it, and to make a long story short, the Lord, Lord healed them. Today they're 54 years old. Oh, healed, but there was a time when I, that's probably what I'd ask for. Yeah. And my, um, my wife came down with, Bulgaric's disease. Nine months later, died of it. And I suppose there was a time when I, that would have been the request to spare my wife. And a few years later, my uh, one of my twin boys was found with a brain tumor the size of a man's fist, five inches by four inches. He lived on the edge of death for a year. I thought that maybe that would have was during that time. Maybe this would have been what I'd asked. Then one of my daughters contracted Lou Gehrig's disease. She died of it too. Thirty-year-old mother. I thought maybe Lord, maybe that, maybe that would have been the request I would have asked. <clears throat> 
Then another one of my daughters died at 54 of the same disease. I said, uh, no, I can see that. That would have probably been important at the time, but I'll tell the Lord what I want. I want to be able to convince people that salvation is what you said it is. Amen. I'm willing to die to do it. I'm willing to bear thorns to do it. But that's what I want. Today, that's what I want for you. To be able to see what we've been talking about. And to tap into it. And in so doing, you'll glorify God. The angels will see it, they'll glorify it. Men will see it, they'll glorify it. I think I'll leave you with those words, but this is a great uh, burden that I carry. It's similar to Paul's, uh, he said, that which comes upon me daily the care of all the churches. Oh, Lord. In Paul's day, a defection had already started. Jude saw it, and he had to write about it. Jesus saw it in the churches of Asia and had to write about it. A defection had already started before just a little bit of half of the first century has passed, and people had already started drifting from God. Paul was raised up. He was especially adept at doing this. And perhaps there's somebody here who'd like to be able to be in that number. To persuade men. Not just tell them. See, that goes, that goes more than just telling them. They have to be told, but to persuade men that God is exactly what he has represented himself to be, that Jesus is precisely what he represented himself to be, that the salvation of God is precisely what he said it to be. And when you feel like that, you will have great peace. Amen. Amen.